you ever felt like you were living a narrative that someone else wrote for you? Maybe your story was written by your family, your church, or your culture. You may be asking yourself, what is my story? And how does it uniquely fit into the story of the gospel? At the Allender Center, we believe that your story reveals God's wild goodness in a way that no other story can. We've helped thousands of people understand and live their unique stories, and we'd like to invite you to start engaging your story with the free guided exercise available for download at theallendercenter.org slash story. Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. There are episodes that are unquestionably ones that we look forward to. And I, I, let, let me state that again. I look forward to all the podcasts, but come on. There's some I look forward to more. And this just happens to be one. Uh, Matthias Roberts. First, let me just welcome you before I start talking about you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to be here. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this too, very much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're going to have to endure maybe a little longer introduction because we're both going to introduce you. But before we get very far at all, I want people to know you are an amazing author and you have a fabulous book coming out in a matter of hours, days, <laughs> coming out October 3rd. It's called Holy Runaways, Re Rediscovering Faith After Being Burned by Religion. Second book, Beyond Shame, Creating a Healthy Sex Life on Your Own Terms. Look, you are a remarkable human being. And as you would describe yourself, a queer therapist, you do a remarkable podcast called Queerology, Podcast on Belief and Being. Uh, you are an Allender Center facilitator, at, you know, and then to just say, look, you are a brilliant, playful, kind, honest but hilarious human <laughs> being uh, who, for me, captures the audacity of the gospel in all of its beauty and, in some sense, irony and, in many ways, oddity. Uh, so I hope you can be fully honored by being described as a lovely and odd man. Mm, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And Rachel, how yeah. would you introduce your friend? Oh, it's like hard to top that. I, one thing I would say is I do believe Matthias may have somewhat of a familiar voice to you if you had an opportunity to listen to the podcast that Dan, Matthias, and Shalee Stearns did on Lost at Sea, the shipwreck. Lost at Sea. Yeah, the conversation. That was one of the f most pleasurable teaching realms that I, I have had it's so being fun. able to be with you and Shelley. So yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, for yeah. That um, you know, this, I just feel really privileged that I get to be a part of these conversations. But Matthias is very dear to me, you are very dear to me, because um, even just in spending time with your book, it was so fun to remember how long I've had just like a small, like chance to kind of witness so many parts of your life and these kind of threshold moments. And so um, just, you know, we first got introduced when you applied to the Seattle school, like right after college, or yeah. like, even I think you were still in college when you still applied in college. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just, um, you are, I think this was named in the forward, and I, I will let people encounter it, but you are a trustworthy um guide you are a trustworthy like pastor and therapist and thought leader and um i have known that you're funny 
Um, but I feel like Holy Runaways really lets like your witty, almost like I want to be like Southern grandma out. Like I'm like, you are like the jokes you made, the ways in which you were like so um, like I was saying, I was telling Dan earlier, like it is a, it is, it's like an ir- irreverence that's so endearing. Mm-hmm. And I just felt so grateful. Um, you know, just we've talked to having my own story of being a holy runaway in many regards. Um, I felt so grateful that at moments that really are touching on deep pain and exile and, and loneliness and shame, there were such beautiful moments of levity mm-hmm. um, that I think are just very representative of just your human sizeness and like the robustness that makes you, you. Mm-hmm. And so I, um, I would echo all of, all that Dan has said. I think he said it so very well with very poetic language. Um, but I, this, I said this to you and I will say it again, like what a gift you've given us. And it's a real privilege and honor to host you today and mm. and for our listeners to get a taste of what they could receive if they were to spend time um, with this this generous gift of story and brilliance and um, heartache, but also profound, gritty, like in the dirt hope. Mm-hmm. So how are you handling our lengthy introduction before we begin talking about this superlative book. I'm, I'm trying to let it, I'm trying to take it in. I'm trying to let it register. Like, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's hard to sit with the goodness and um, yeah, I feel like I am and I'm just feel grateful. And it, it, it feels like being able to sit with dear friends, but Often with good friendships, we don't get to say these kinds of things to each other. So, <laughs> yeah. right, it's really fun. Yeah, and and, and un, unfortunately for the audience, they don't get to see our faces, mm-hmm. or in certain cases, maybe it is fortune. But um, in this case, uh, you are such a kind. I, I, I'd also say that so much of the humor in the book is very sardonic, <laughs> but it is infinitely far from cynical, mm-hmm. um, even though there are so many reasons for you to be a righteously angry man for what you have endured. Um, yet there is, again, what what we'll keep coming back to is there is the playfulness of the resurrection mm-hmm. in this memoir. Mm-hmm. And so let, let's at least set the context of the book. Um, and, you know, as a gay man coming in and through and with and for and against uh, the conservative uh, evangelical fundamentalist community, there is so much that you have encountered in the process of losing, gaining, regaining, redefining, reframing, but believing. Mm-hmm. And so I, just to give people a, a feel of what prompted this lovely book mm-hmm. to come to be. Mm-hmm. So, so much of it was born out of my own questions. I, I, I think, you know, in some ways, this, this book is the question that I feel like I have been living for most of my life. Mm-hmm. What do I do with this faith that kind of was given to me? Uh, and yet that I deeply believe, and, and that has, you know, evolved throughout time. But, but I think a few years ago, when this kind of idea came to me, it 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 was a sense of, I I really want to figure out healing hmm. um, and and figure out how to reintegrate after there has been so much harm. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I saw that within myself and felt that within myself, but also noticed so many other people seeming to be asking very similar questions and uh, felt like, you know, I, I think I have something to say here. And have been trained in ways that mm-hmm. not many people uh, have been. <laughs> Much of that came through both of you. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wanted to explore explore those questions within those contexts. 
Well, I think one of the things about the memoir is that irrespective of your sexual orientation, all of us at some level know what it means to be a runaway. And yet I want you to put words to that from the realm of your own story. Yet the reality of, of we live in an era of deconstruction and an era where there's very little reconstruction, uh, re-engagement. So y y you, you hold um, amazing tension well. That's what mm -hmm. I meant, tried to say with regard to the ability to be sardonic but not sarcastic, mm -hmm. the ability to talk about real heartache and yet to do so with a generosity mm -hmm. that is really rare, uh, again, anywhere with anyone. Um, it, it is such a compelling model for all of us to be able to hold the tensions of our own heartache with the believing community, with the church, with other Christians, with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, before we jump in, like, how, how now? How, how have you held those tensions well? I, I don't know that I have a, a great answer for that, um, for, for the how. You, you know, I think there's such tension within myself. And, and, and I think having to hold, you know, growing up in, in this world where I was very, you know, non-explicit ways, but also in very explicit ways told, like, I... I or you to me don't belong. You don't belong here. Um, mm -hmm. You actually can't hold these identities that you hold. You cannot be a gay person and a Christian. Not possible. Uh, or if you want to be a Christian, you have to change these things about yourself mm -hmm. that uh, I felt and realized like I can't change this about myself. I've I tried so hard and for so long. And yet still encountering so many people, my community there who were like, I couldn't deny that they were kind, loving people. Like th they were, they are. I you know, deeply disagree and have been deeply harmed by some of those same people. But, but that sense of, I can't write these people off, even if I have been harmed by them, ha has been a perpetual tension that I've had to navigate mm -hmm. uh, and have had to look at in many different ways. At first I thought, well, I can still engage with them. <laughs> I can try to help them see the ways they're harming me. I, I don't really do that anymore. Like I've, I've, right. I've kind of switched tactics of like, you know what? I, I <laughs> they can do their own thing and I'm going to do my thing and then that's okay. Um, but yeah, there, there's still, there's still profound tension there. Um, yeah. So it, in one sense you have lived well, with that tension, or at least had to live in the face and the awareness of it for mm -hmm. many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I want to just pause here for a minute because I don't, I want to make sure people aren't missing what you're saying. And I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable, Matthias, but I don't know how many of us in the places we've been harmed by communities even by people that we love and could say, especially like, let's say in the past, we do math, seven years um, with all that's happened in our world, have had the capacity to hold on to the humanity of others in the way you just named. So mm. um, I'm just very struck. And, you know, I, one of the things I have felt in spending time with your labor of love is actually like deep, deep conviction mm -hmm. <laughs> place. And I know that's like such a, like such a loaded word, but I have felt deeply convicted in the ways I have not actually loved well, mm -hmm. um, as a defensive mechanism. And I just want to say thank you. And I don't want people to lose what you're naming. Um, as if it's like, you didn't have a choice when I think you have actually had tremendous choice at, at, at many moments and it speaks so much to your integrity, mm -hmm. um, like your profound integrity to let the parts um, be honored and held together with wisdom. And I love that you're naming, and I think this is true for 
lots of survivors of different forms of trauma doesn't always mean staying. And that's why I love, I love the name of your book. Like there can be something really honoring and holy about leaving, about departing, Mm -hmm. about saying, I'm not actually going to subject myself to this harm anymore. And, um, and in leaving, I don't also have to villainize you and split you off. Right. But that's hard. Yes. Yes. And, and especially when people are giving you a lot of reasons for it to be easy. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Full disclosure. I'm not talking, you know, autobiographically at all. No, right now. None whatsoever. <laughs> but the interplay in the memoir of uh, such rich theological reflection, yeah. of oh, amazing yeah. clarity about neuroscience and honoring of interpersonal relational dynamic therapy and Rene Girard and and, and it, it's almost like we could I could unfortunately ramble on that for a long time other than to say um, th- this reflection of your life I, I, I do wonder what the process was like for you to write it because I did have the privilege sitting at uh, sh- dinner with Shelley and Dave Stearns um, it it felt like it was a long labor mm-hmm. to finish this book. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious as to what you thought and what you see now as the process to be able to create this work. It was a long labor. I think I think that night that we had dinner, I was like in the midst of I don't even know how I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to get done, uh, and. You know, for me, and I don't think this will be surprising to anyone, and yet it was to me, like, writing about God is difficult. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and I don't think I had any idea what I was getting into when I first kind of wrote the proposal for this book and was like, well, here's where I talk about God. And then when I actually got to having to talk about God and, and, and these kind of theological ideas that I play with in the book... I really had to sit with, do I even believe what I think I'm trying to write? Like, and sometimes the answer was no, I don't, I don't think I do. And that made it so difficult to then try to write in a way that felt honest about my disbelief while also saying, here's what I think I believe. And here's what I don't know if I believe or don't believe. Like it, it was, it felt so complicated and I felt really pulled towards, I can just write what I used to believe, uh, but I didn't want to do that. And it it was painful at times, Mm -hmm. Um, excruciating. Yeah. And I I think that's part of how, when I read the book, the integrity of being able to claim, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, There is that richness of um, not merely I believe or merely I don't believe, Mm -hmm. but the willingness to feel within yourself desire. Mm -hmm. And there's a brilliant several chapters on desire. Mm -hmm. And I should say that the, the chapters are a plethora, but they're brief. Mm-hmm. And yet the command of language, particularly of metaphor, like oh, I, uh, this will not make a lot of sense to people until they read the book, but I, I want you to talk a little bit about concrete. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a beautiful framing <laughs> of the labor that you have gone through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I play with this metaphor of concrete a, a lot in the book. And it was very unexpected to me. I didn't expect to write a, uh, a lot about the science of how concrete hardens. <laughs> but <laughs> here, here we are. Uh, but the interesting thing about, about concrete, if you all bear with me for a moment, is that concrete's a material that gets stronger as it compresses. So so th- th- this this curiosity came to me when I was... You know, here in Seattle, we have these floating bridges that are built out of concrete. And they're these, I mean, they're massive bridges that float on top of Lake Washington. 
you know, hundreds of thousands of cars go over them every day. And I went over this bridge and I was like, this is, this is made out of concrete. And yet the concrete in my apartment is cracking and letting water in. Like, well, how in the world, how is this true of, of this material? And, and what I learned, it, it, it grows strength under compression, but is profoundly brittle under tension. So anything that pushes on it without compressing, it shatters. Um, but when it's compressed, it can hold a lot of weight. And as I thought about that, I, I, I kind of realized or connected for me that that's actually kind of how I was taught to think about my faith. I, I grew up in a world where uh, apologetics seemed to be the savior of our mm. faith. Uh, like I <laughs> distinctly remember... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in front of the TV as my parents played Ken Ham videos describing why, you know, literal seven day creation is the bedrock of our faith and how to argue with people who believe in evolution with these airtight arguments that, you know, you get out in the real world and realize they aren't airtight at all. <laughs> but it, that compressed, it, it, it piled on all of this weight um, that made the faith strong. But when tension was introduced uh, through the means of empathy in, in my life, seeing people who were hurting and realizing that what they were telling me is very different from what people in my communities were telling me about those people, like things started to shatter. And I, I have found that metaphor just profoundly helpful when thinking about faith and, and some of these other mechanisms that, that come into play. Oh, and I just, I think one thing I so deeply appreciate is, one, your brilliance in weaving these metaphors, Dan named this, your brilliance in taking complex theological, philosophical, psychological, sociological concepts and making them accessible, but in a, I think it's okay to say this about you, a deeply pastoral way. Mm. Um, and the metaphor of concrete is a deeply pastoral metaphor. And, um, because these, these places where, you know, the brittleness of concrete starts to fracture and it, you name so well, um, you move so tenderly that it's terrifying. Mm. It's heartbreaking. It's disorienting. Um, and yeah, I just, so <laughs> So grateful for your tender um, engagement with these realities that is bold. You're not shying away from how they got here and what they're connected to. <laughs> I think so many of us can relate to, um, yeah, coming from maybe much more rigid faith structures that, yeah, as soon as you got out into the real world or encountered a world and encountered any kind of tension, you know, I remember one of my professors in undergrad in my biblical studies uh, at a liberal arts school where I had 72 existential crises, like at least once a week, um, <laughs> or at least every week I had about 72 existential crises. Um, I mean, so many, but he was teaching our class. I don't even remember which class it was because he was our oldest professor and he was our Greek professor. But, um, you know, I think in some ways he had brought forth like one of the complex passages around like, can you lose your salvation or not? And with all these like Southern Baptist kids um, and he presented like seven different like ways to read this text in different ways, it, what it could mean. And, you know, we're like, surely he's going to tell us the right one. You know, mm -hmm. that's how we've been formed. He's going to tell us which one we need to like believe. And I remember him saying something like, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I stand on the promises of God, but I heed the warnings and so much like our our faith um is meant to exist in tension is and it, and it's like a tightrope and anytime we try to resolve the tension with like an easy answer or you know a, a false dichotomy we lose the tension and the whole thing falls apart and in some ways i i feel like you've captured that so well um both in story and and in in memoir but in also also in a a pastoral therapeutic call. Mm -hmm. Before we leave this, anything else that you want to bring? Because you, you really are a concrete nerd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, I mean, something that I find so fascinating about concrete <laughs> is that it, it, it technically never stops hardening. Um, and, and that is just mind blowing to me. Like, and, and if it's mixed correctly, it can self repair. And like, I mean, that metaphor applied to my faith so much. Like my faith was meant to harden. My faith was supposed to be self healing. Like all those things that didn't, again, didn't end up actually being true when faced with human suffering and, and actually listening to people with stories that are different than mine, but also realizing and, and recognizing my own suffering and, and seeing mm-hmm. there is something wrong here. Um, this uh, hardness of my faith can't actually contend with this pain. Um, well, anything else you want to add about the Mayans? Uh, that that they used concrete. You're you're, you're fishing for something. <laughs> no, no. I'm honestly like I learned so much about concrete that it's like I I, I know this this could probably be cut out, but we're not. <laughs> Uh, it's just so rich a reality mm-hmm. and then to go did you ever make the furniture oh <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> thank god but like so relatable because you know i won't give to i don't think we're giving anything away to be able to say you talk about how you were actually going to like make concrete furniture and this is in part what led to the path to really going on a deep dive with concrete yeah. but i but it happened at the beginning of the pandemic and that's part of what i loved it was like how many of us you know something <laughs> came on instagram things. that we were like i'm gonna start baking or i'm gonna m- make sourdough and i couldn't make sourdough and i just loved that like yeah it could have been any one of those things that everybody else did but no you're going to make no, concrete furniture <laughs> no sourdough for you buddy i'm gonna <laughs> make concrete furniture yeah <laughs> anyway, just just to leave that aside Let, uh, the category of runaway I, I would just love for you to mm. think about why that's such an important category not only for the book but mm. for your own engagement with god mm-hmm. i i think the, the category of runaway is, is one that i feel like the most people have an intuitive understanding of like i think many of us had experiences you know as children where we tried to run away from home like whether that was for very like i mean i think there's a spectrum here some of us it was kind right. of a playful thing other people it wasn't playful at all it was i need to get out of here right. for my own yeah. survival but but that sense of running away from something in order to find something new, in order to, in some ways, step into hope. Um, mm. I think it's something that, that many, if not most people, understand deeply. And when I thought about my faith and in the communities that I grew up within, I, 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 I kind of realized, like, I, I have run away from those. Like I, I, there's something in those places that I was like, I, I don't want anything to do with this. And yet I, I want to run towards something. Like <laughs> I have hope for what this could be, that idea of running away from home to go pursue your dreams. Like th- th- that was really what I wanted to play with in that. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I, you know, I talk about it that way. I talk about it in the way of, of also you know, as adults, you know, many of us have had experiences, yeah, where we've needed to run away, where there has been profound harm. And, and we've at some point been able to say, no more, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Uh, and again, this is usually in service of trying to find something different, um, advocating on our own behalfs uh, to, to find healing, flourishing, um, Hmm. hope, safety. That that framework of being able to name something is not right, Mm -hmm. something is not well, and to depart um, in some ways, it's a different category in Genesis 12 with Abram's and Sarai's departure. Mm -hmm. But there is a sense in which God always seems to call us out of um, and often into something that is unknown. Mm-hmm. And yet within that hope lies uh, rich, if not extreme, desire that we are um, 
both systemically, theologically, but also often interpersonally, um, opposed to and um, been taught to be abhorred about so that we don't enter that desire. So as a young boy, you, you speak about wanting to run away. Uh, and you have this very lovely but odd phrase that you only wanted to run away primarily in the winter. Yes. <laughs> and you, you said, uh, again, not, not to quote every, but I don't know why. <laughs> have you pondered that? I have pondered it a little bit. Uh, and and I, what I what I wonder is if like if it was just because we were all stuck inside so much, like, <laughs> like <laughs> stuck inside with mom, stuck inside with my sisters, like the 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 just like tired of being inside um, in the winter and cold Iowa winters. Like it gets cold in Iowa. And let me just say rather bluntly, you, you therapeutically, theologically. Uh, are far richer than looking only at that current on the surface. So there is more, would you not say, Hagar? Yes. I, yeah, I, yes, that, I think that is true. Uh, and m my home was intolerable at times. Uh, and I think especially you know, th these memories are pre pre realizing or having language for what was different about me. Uh, but that difference was there. <laughs> uh, I did not fit the mold of what little boys were supposed to be like. Uh, and I mean, my, my fantasy of running away was even like, I'm going to go to Nashville and figure out how to become like Amy Grant. Like that was, that was the dream. <laughs> like, <laughs> Which I just loved that little Matthias. So sweet. And yet heartbreaking. heartbreaking. I think that's when the, the reality of you, you have honored, you have told the truth about your family. You have honored such kindness and care for your family and don't wish to go any further in this other than to say that, that the deep distress in some sense the developmental trauma that you were in the middle of mm -hmm. would put you in a position very similar to hagar mm -hmm. and she didn't have a winter to go into but the desert really was suicide yeah. it was death right death is better mm -hmm. right right and 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 yeah, I think, I mean, that that is a level absolutely where I think it's true. And, like, my mom would give me cheese sticks. Like, she'd be like, okay, hun, like, here's some snacks. Like, she'd never say this, but essentially, we'll see you in a few hours. Like, she just <laughs> kind of was like, here you go. <laughs> like, there, there's something in there that, I mean, I was so serious, but I think my mom was kind of playful in a, in a way that, uh, the looking back feels really lovely, even if it, there's a undercurrent there of something far more serious. Yeah. yeah. And I think that describes what I think Rachel and I were so taken by, and that is where there is sweetness and goodness, you honor it. Where there is madness and truly trauma, you honor it. Mm -hmm. And yet the ability to hold the complexity of that tension is really, uh, as I said earlier, um, it, it is a picture of what we are all meant to bring with regard to the experience of both the heartache, but also the hope. Mm. And the ability to hold both of those well is where the runaway has a chance to actually hold that until, and you speak of this, until you in one sense reject one community and then find yourself in a shame bind because you've joined another that has to hold the other group with contempt. And then you become as dogmatic as the other side is. And in one sense, it's just a shift of contempt and dogmatism from one world to the other without that ability to bear, again, the heartache of many communities have great harm and great goodness. Mm -hmm. Many families have that. 
what's it like to hold it together? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that's the difficulty. And it, or it is, yeah, it is the difficulty. And I, I, I feel like I see so often folks who are in this realm of deconstruction you know, the first step or the first few steps is, is, is one of rejecting saying like, I reject this community. I have now found my new community. Uh, and we're going to go and talk about all the ways that our old community is bad and it can hear me really well. I'm not saying that I think we need that. Like, <laughs> I think we need those stepping stones in order to be able to leave, <laughs> mm-hmm. to find a new sense of self and to, to to develop that. But I think when we get stuck there, we get stuck in this ever back and forth kind of frothing of who's in and who's out and what are the rules? What are the right things? Who are we listening to now? Uh, instead of finding uh, uh, something that's kind of life giving, something that brings flourishing, so that we're able to live our lives in, I think, integrated, uh, in some ways, peace filled ways uh, that, that is far more grounded than who's right and who's wrong. Hmm. Well, I was saying to Dan before we. We, we all joined together that um, part of what has been true for me in spending time, and I'm just going to keep calling it with your labor of love, because I feel that I feel that there this was written in some blood. And that's what I think about something that's a labor of love. I think about what it is for something to be written with some blood, you know, like it, this is this is a costly labor of love um, that I feel like I rediscovered Jesus in ways I desperately needed. And I know some listening will hear that and, you know, on one hand be imagining like, I don't know if I'm ready to read about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then I know other people will hear that and be like, but we're reading about Jesus, you know? So it's like, I think you've, you have, again, you have lived into that complexity and tension so well, but um, I think to the extent you'd want to talk about this, it's rare for me um, with people talking about running away. And, um, and in some ways, acknowledging the need for deconstruction, um, to mention the resurrection of Jesus, and the literal (laughs) resurrection of Jesus. And when you did, it, it like took my breath away. And not that I was like, I didn't expect I know you, I like I I wasn't shocked that you were talking about that. It just was the way in which you were weaving this and bringing these stories of Jesus to bear. I just felt so deeply grateful. It felt like a, um, I think you use language of like a breeze, like a fresh, like a fresh wind of life that I just felt so grateful for. Um, and again, was in awe of like, how? <laughs> that question of how, how? So when you say, yeah, writing about God became a lot more complex. Like I totally can relate to, yeah, the binds that we're in because of these kind of shame bound polarities. Um, But I'm wondering if you could put a little words to this resurrected Jesus that you've encountered. Yeah. I mean, I I, I remember it's years ago at this point, but back, back in 2016, pre 2016 election, I, I posted some lyrics to a song uh, that I really loved. And, and, and these lyrics are by a band called The Brilliance. And and they say something like, Jesus, like in your weakness, bring hope to all the world. And I that really resonated for me. So I put, you know, put them on Facebook uh, as we did back then. And immediately started having people comment like, what do you mean the weakness of Jesus? <laughs> How dare you talk about Jesus this way? In my weakness, he is strong. And and it made me realize, like, and not so much a defensiveness, but like, a, oh my gosh, the way I think about Jesus has shifted so much mm-hmm. from the way I was, from what I was taught about Jesus, mm-hmm. be, Jesus being this strong victor. But 
it, it, it kind of exposed for me this sense of I I think there's something about Jesus's weakness, this reality, his humanity, that that Jesus was killed, right? Like we have these disciples who are assuming or thinking like we, he, this Messiah is going to come in and you know overthrow the empire mm-hmm. and usher in this new kingdom and, and be this strong victorious presence. Uh, and instead, he gets murdered, right? And in some ways, willingly chooses to be murdered. Uh, it tells them not to fight on his behalf in the garden. It says like no. Uh, and and that from the perspective of what we consider to be power, right. strength, it is profoundly weak, right? Cowardly even. Uh, and, and yet, I, I think there's something in that. And this is what gives me so much hope that, that actually starts to expose through this resurrection that this kind of weakness, quote unquote weakness, it is actually... Um, it subverts every system of human power and, and exposes it for what it is violence, death dealing, and ushers in this, this other form of power, if we even want to call it that, <laughs> that is love. Um, and in, in this moment of resurrection, and, and I do believe in a literal resurrection. And I mean, I'll say this, I I don't know that this is the context where this needs to be said, but I'll say this, like, I don't really care what you believe about the resurrection. I don't really care if you think it's non-literal or like, it's not important to me. But for me, (laughs) it, it it is literal because of this subversion that happened. Uh, that that exposed these violent systems of human systems for for what they are. Hmm. Um, mm, that is so powerful to me. Well, the framework then of of a faith that eschews all the standard structures mm-hmm. for how to avoid shame. Yes, all the means by which we subvert scapegoating mm-hmm. you know in so many ways uh again not to get too geeky here but you, your engagement with allison gerard the framing of a, a, a weak god whose strength is in vulnerability uh it, it certainly stands against the the Jesus of empire, That's right. uh, the Jesus that thwarts, in one sense, the engagement with shame because we become shameless like him. Uh, that is a gospel that, even if it was never preached that way, in some ways was the gospel below the surface. And I think that's, again, one of those elements of you haven't been bound to that Jesus because you couldn't be, mm-hmm. because your body couldn't be, mm-hmm. and your sense of who you were and your identity couldn't be. Mm-hmm. And therefore, in some sense, though this will sound like it was easy, and I don't mean that by any means, that in one sense, it was easier for you to see the foolishness uh, of that empire Jesus than it might have been for others. Mm-hmm. And yet your ability, again, to hold these tensions, um, you've not eschewed the seeds of your youth, yet they have been planted in places to allow levels of flourishing, to reject scapegoating, to reject false use of shame and judgment. Mm-hmm. Um Again, we come back to this simple phrase. It's a superlative labor Mm -hmm. and one that for anyone who has known what it is to feel disenchanted, disconnected from the community of faith, um, this is a labor of love, as Rachel has put it well, (laughs) inviting us. Uh, Before we end, uh, I wanted to just read one of your last sentences, if that would be 
workable. Mm -hmm. Faith is letting go of certainty, letting those concrete boxes crack wide open and crumble into gravel, then dust, knowing that soon the dust will be swept up by a familiar warm breeze and scattered across a wide green meadow where new things will grow. <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> and the fact that the concrete becomes seeds. Come on, man. <laughs> it's hilarious, first of all. Um, something unliving that actually is quite living <laughs> becomes the very basis that this deadly dogmatism can actually be broken apart and... Yeah something of the flourishing, as you have put it well. So mm. Matthias mm. may may great good come yeah. as a result of your labor of love. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And also like kindness and restoration for your body. I know mm. like books are so strange because you finish them long before they actually come out, but there's something about them being released into the world that is a sort of you know, ending, but new beginning. And um, we, if you haven't gotten this, we want you to spend time with Matthias's book. And there's a special deal going on right now. If you pre-order his book before October 6th, right? You said mm -hmm. before October 6th, even though it comes out on the third, if you order it, um, you get access to a webinar that Matthias and I did on healing from spiritual abuse. It's a $49 value. You'll get it for free if you pre-order the book. Um, and you can find that on holyrunaways.com where you can order his book from multiple different sources, depending on where you want to support and, and spend your money. Um, but I encourage you to do it. Um, there's much work to be done. Um, we need more healing. Uh, we need more courage. Uh, we need a lot more love and mercy. And so again, I too say thank you, Matthias. Amen. And let, let's just add, that's a great deal. It's a freaking great deal. It is is there any deal. other merch you're giving away? Any hats? <laughs> any? Uh... I wish. I'll make a hat for you, Dan. <laughs> Would you really? I know. I just got myself into something. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll make you a hat. I would just take a holy <laughs> runaway hat. <laughs> great. Well, see if I can figure that out. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Look. With all your extra time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, look, you're not making concrete furniture. You got That's a few true. hours. Right. Yes. <laughs> Again, we'll just say <laughs> this could go on forever. And we'll just say again, thank you. Thank you, dear friend. Thank you. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.